like to welcome everybody to Professional Insights. Our guest today is Kat, Kathy Cholik, who uh, works for uh, Living Well with Dementia. And welcome, Kathy, and thank you so much for doing this. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, so my background is in physical therapy. I've been a, a PT for 30 years this year. Uh, and so and my background has entirely been in working with older adults. Uh, I really fell in love with that population. Um, my introduction to dementia really started because uh, my grandmother had dementia. Uh, and in fact, it kind of scared me away for a little while of thinking I wanted to work with older adults, but really my passions matched up really well. And um, I, hopefully my patients. Um, in working with this population. So I, um, I've taught in a um, physical therapy program, but mostly my career has worked in uh, long-term care facilities and in home health, some in the outpatient as well, uh, really predominantly with um, the oldest old, I guess, within the spectrum um, and people who are aging and a lot has really turned out to be in working with people with dementia. Okay, um, my first question is, can you explain the, the benefits of any type of exercise? Yeah, so, you know, exercise is a little different from just physical activity, which, you know, some people recognize. Both are good, uh, but, you know, physical activity is kind of the stuff you might do during a normal day. Exercise is really a specific um, planned activity that looks at improving or maintaining physical fitness. So it's more intentional. Uh, and less just kind of the things you stumble across during your day. So when you look at that, there's really four kinds of exercise we classify. One is aerobic, which is what most people think of cardiovascular health. So walking or running or jogging, biking, swimming, but also dancing um, and Tai Chi, different kinds of forms can come in there. But also strengthening, uh, which is more your typical resistance training. So lifting weights, but also lifting your own body weight uh, can certainly qualify in there. And there's balance, uh, which is it's kind of its own balance and functional training and its own group and stretching. So those make up exercise. And it's really important uh, for everyone, uh, just for physical health, but also we know a lot more about cognitive and, um, and mental health uh, and how important exercise can be. Okay, how about uh, the importance of people uh, with dementia exercising? So um, from the physical piece, uh, if we don't exercise or be active, um, it's kind of a use it or lose it kind of concept. So the more we are um, not moving, the, the greater potential is for weakness, challenges with our balance um, and potential for falls and loss of um, cardiovascular health. And cardiovascular health is really important in like blood and brain perfusion, not just heart is where we tend to think of it. Um, and so those are the kind of like the physical pieces, but the data is really growing and has grown, I would say, in the last 10 years um, of what we know from like the psychosocial benefits of exercise. There is um, showing information of reducing anxiety, reducing issues with depression. Um, in fact, the whole world in, in mental health of, of physical activity and exercise is really a growing area of, of concentration. But also when we talk about that blood perfusion, there is some data that shows one of the best things in pr protecting cognitive health is regular physical activity and exercise, um, being mobile. Then there's the whole social support piece of particularly group dynamic ex exercises. I'm um, just getting out of your house, um, reducing isolation and loneliness. Um, if you can find a group to engage with. Um, but there was a, a great quote from an Australia group um, that was assessing family members and people with dementia. And what they found was um, people who were exercising were more alert and able to communicate more effectively on the days they were physically active, which when we look at all of the negative kind of sequelae um, or side effects sometimes of dementia, that ability to communicate and, and engage with your family is so important. Um, kind of a sidebar of that, with people with dementia, a lot of people are in walkers. Um, can you kind of talk to them a little bit about, you know, just kind of making do with what you have, even if you just have to sit down and do the exercise just to move the body parts and keep the muscles, you know, from at atrophying? Mm -hmm. So the three of the four kinds of exercise can really be done in sitting. You know, so cardiovascular health or that aerobic piece you can do on a bike or with a bike with pedals or um, even just doing lots of repetitive action. 
um, to kind of get your heart rate up. Um, strengthening can absolutely be done in sitting, uh, lifting weights as long as they're heavy enough. Um, but also your body weight is its own great resistance thing. And, and a lot of when I was doing home health was just showing people how to use their body to make your own exercise, just repeatedly sitting and standing from a chair is a great exercise for these big thigh muscles in our, our quadriceps. Um, and in fact, it's one of the great tests we use as PTs to kind of test lower extremity strength or leg strength. Um, the other one you could do stretching from a sitting or a lying position. Um, the balance one is the real kicker, the one that really kind of helps us look at prevent and falls. There's, uh, that's the hard one to do really from a sitting to have it translate into walking or standing balance. Um, but the first three can absolutely really be accomplished from a sitting position. And that's why, you know, a lot getting involved at whatever level you're capable is really important. Okay. A lot of people kind of get confused when you say chair exercise. Can you kind of explain what chair exercise means? Yeah. So, you know, if you're looking from an aerobic perspective, so let's talk about that, just that cardiovascular, we want to do anything that gets your heart rate up. So, you know, repeated sitting to standing can be one of those activities that challenges your, your um, heart system. Um, but also, you know, doing repeated arm movements, a chair, a kind of aerobic program. But even some things like chair yoga um, is really kind of an adaptive program that has kind of grown. Um, I have taught some, been taught some adaptive Tai Chi from a sitting position. Just putting your body through its paces a little bit, if sitting is the safest way in, in managing that risk, um, of uh, you know, allowing you to do things from a position that you feel comfortable about and maybe are going to allow you to do more than what you would perhaps be able to do standing. And um, about how often and, uh, you know, with a group should, should somebody try to exercise? Yeah, so um, the guidelines from, um, from our government and a bunch of different agencies is pretty standard across the world. Ideally, you want to do about what they consider 150 minutes a week of, of an aerobic type program. And it's not like, remember what we think of the 70s aerobics, something that gets your heart rate up. Um, so, you know, it can be dancing, it can be a sitting exercise program. If it's strenuous enough that you feel like you're at a moderate intensity, which maybe is probably a little challenging to continue to have a conversation during, that's one of, we have a talk test this seat to help us identify intensity, um, you know, or you should feel like you're working moderately hard, not to the hardest possible. Um, so about 150 minutes over the course of a week. So they break it down a lot of times into five days a week at 30 minutes, but there is huge flexibility in how you meet that. The guidelines look at about 10 minutes at a time um, to really be enough time to get kind of your heart rate elevated for it to count for your heart health. Strengthening is ideally a minimum of twice a week, sometimes three times a week. Um, to do real strengthening, you should have a day off in between because your muscles kind of need a day to recover if you're working hard enough at the strengthening to really be effective. Balance is, again, like a three-time-a-week thing. All of these are recommended guidelines. Um, do what you want when you can. Um, it is kind of, you know, when people say, what type is best? What exercise is best? For me, it what it's best is anything I can get someone they're willing to do. Um, Cause if you're willing to do it, then I can make parameters around it that are, are individualized for you. Um, what do you have access to? What are you going to be able to, and willing to do? Um, it is very unique for each individual. Um, can you kind of explain the, uh, the, the psychological aspects of exercise, you know, the, the interaction and being around other people and be able to, you know, laugh and joke and, and kind of, um, you know, be yourself and, and be out amongst people. Absolutely. I think when we have, again, when you look at where there's being some research done these days, isolation and loneliness are um, a huge negative psychological impact. Um, and so being able to get out into a group, there's also an accountability piece. I'll be perfectly honest, um, exercising is not my favorite thing to do. Um, but, you know, I've kind of had a partner for the last um, bunch of months and held me accountable to being sure I go, uh, which is really helpful for me, uh, having an external accountability. Um, and so that group, but when you get there, you see people, you're going to smile. Smiling is contagious. That positive mood is interactive. 
Um, and we all kind of feel better when we have, there, there's a basic human need for connection and, and really um, exercise groups and um, support groups or whatever group activity uh, is really a great way to do it. Plus there's a lovely endorphin release that you know the chemicals in your body that you do after exercise make you just feel better. And so if you can kind of get over that hump of getting started, um, you're gonna feel better after you do it. What would you tell uh, somebody who has just been diagnosed you know, with dementia and feels that they can't really do anything anymore? You know, the, the whole psychological trying to get out of that, that hole that, that you're in when you're trying to deal with it. How would you explain to them, you know, getting out and doing something and, or keep doing something is so important? So one of the, um, you know, beliefs around the system is really in, you know, in both person-centered kind of, of care, but also in, um, in the person's identity, right? And that one of the worst things we as healthcare professionals do is, is not give people hope. And, and while there are a lot of things you need to talk about and prepare for, and, and set, you know, it's not a walk in the park having dementia. But when we take away any expectation that people are still capable of things, um, it, it is to their detriment. My work was really trying to help people see all they're still capable of. Maybe different and maybe have to manipulate it a little bit or coordinate it better, have some extra people around to kind of help make things happen. But there is so much people still are capable of doing. And if we self-limit, it only sets a negative spiral. And so trying to find what you're capable of with some guidance and some safety parameters perhaps in place. Like I live in the mid-Atlantic, you know, we had a big cold spell. It wasn't the right time for people to be outside walking, right? Um, icy sidewalk, like there, there are a lot of negative risks that were real. But at the same time, on a, today we're in the 50s and there isn't any reason that, you know, with, with the right parameters in place, somebody couldn't take a good walk outside. Um, you know, so it's not gonna be every day in January that you can't go out, but you have to make sure, you know, do you know your route? Is there a safe way to get home? Is there somebody who can go with you? Um, like all of those kinds, when you put the right safety precautions in place, um, people should be encouraged to, to work at the top edge of their capabilities because that's really how we sustain it. We start shrinking our world too much, um, then our world becomes that much smaller. And so I try to push those edges a lot. Okay. <clears throat> I guess one, um, I'm lucky I live in Las Vegas, so it's, it's sunny here a lot of the time, and I see a lot of people walking. Um, I walk about, oh, maybe at least a half a mile, three to four times a week, um, and a lot of people can't do that. Isn't it important for people just to get out and maybe just walk around, walk down the street or something, just to get up and get out and start out, you know, with maybe little bitty small steps? Absolutely. That 150 minutes is often very scary to people. Um, and that's why I kind of like the 10 minute concept. Can you walk to your mailbox two or three times a day? Every time a commercial comes up, can you do 10 sit to stands um, off the couch? Just starting somewhere um, is better. So, you know, there's this fallacy of 10,000 steps being, you know, like kind of what you need to be able to be mobile. And it's a fallacy. It's really based on a marketing campaign. It really doesn't have a huge amount of data to support it. Um, so it's, but it scares people. So, you know, I really try to look at incremental changes. Can you do 10% more next week than you did this week? You know, if you're a step counter and some people are really good and help, like, like the devices that tell them how many steps they do, they get really good feedback from that. Let's set a goal around a 5% change. And then once you get there, then we'll work on a 5% change again. Um, and, and if you make things too overwhelming, it gets scary and turns people off. And that's why you know, people ask me, what's the best exercise? The best exercise is what you're going to be willing and capable of doing. Um, I like to walk on the treadmill. It's something I enjoy very much. I like to do it while I watch TV. It helps distract my mind. That's not the greatest exercise for a lot of people. Um, I could never run. It's not something that's really in my DNA, but I have family of runners who like to do that. That's great. I will stand on the sides of a 5k and applaud for you. <laughs> you know, that's how I can support you to do that. It's just not going to be my thing. Uh, and really that's okay. Cause as long as we're each meeting our own goals, 
um, that's really what you have to strive for. Okay, um, in closing, um, do you have anything that else you'd like to say to people, you know, that what might be watching this and they're kind of on a border of trying to do exercise or afraid not to? Yeah, so it's really just kind of where, you know, we talk about a little bit about positive risk before. We know the risks of not exercising are that you're probably going to have a functional decline. You may be at more risk for falls. There are some risks of exercising, right? It may, you know, you may have to judge what are the safety of the outside environment if you're going outside. Um, you may, if you're doing a balanced exercise, you may edge towards too risky, um, you know, and, and then there may be a fall. All of that really kind of needs to be weighed out between what we know will happen if you don't versus what could happen if you do. Um, and really try to weigh that out individually to find what is the sweet spot for you um, and what you're willing to do. We all have different risk aversions across our life. I'm a seatbelt wearer. You know, I wear a seatbelt. Every time I go, I was, I was really raised in that mantra. I can't get in a car and not put one on. It's very unusual. Right? But so, you know, there is my kind of risk aversion. I'm not going to jump out of an airplane. That's not my thing. But I probably edge a little faster driving perhaps than some other people, you know, and so really weighing out where anyone's personal risk comfort is, uh, is, is an individual thing. Um, so just figure out where you are and then start there um, and, and get some guidance if you need it from a professional, either a fitness person, a physical therapist, um, occupational therapist. There's, there's lots of people out there and hopefully more opportunities for group interactions um, coming in the future. All right, well, Kathy, well, thank you so much for taking the time today to talk to us and giving us so, you know, some really, really good information. And I'd like to thank everybody else for watching the Professional Insight podcast presented to you by Dementia Action Alliance. You can see many more podcasts on our, on our website, daanow.org slash podcast. And, and thank you again for uh, joining us, Kathy, and thank everybody for watching, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Connecting our lives to help us survive So we live our time to the fullest we can